She is the Reverend Dr. Amanda Cunningham Duxworth. She's been a member of this church for a while and has been on our staff for several years, but she has since moved on and now is uh, over a university in Huntsville. But we've invited her back today for this special occasion to cheer and to encourage and to challenge our graduates. But let me re-familiarize you with Dr. Duxworth. Dr. Duxworth is a native of Columbus, Mississippi. And she is a Bible, she was a bivocational pastor and a corporate professional. She received her license to preach in 1983 and was ordained in ministry in 2001 in Atlanta, Georgia. She founded the Columbus Fellowship Church in Columbus, Mississippi. She also established a nonprofit organization in 2001 uh, called the ADC Ministries. She completed her Master's of Divinity at the Interdenominational Theological Center in uh, Atlanta, Georgia in 2001 received her doctorate of ministry degree from Mercer University in 2008, where she was the first female candidate and also the first uh, African-American person in her doctoral class in 2008. She moved to Birmingham uh, to start the pastoral, or to continue the pastoral care department at Brookwood Medical Center, and she stayed there until January 2009. She came to us around 2009 where she became an associate minister here and was the first female associate minister here. Uh, she recently moved to Huntsville and has taken over the campus dean position at Strayer University in Huntsville. She is, in addition, uh, a knowledgeable professor. She led part of our program here. We started a branch of ITC where we started a certificate and theology program and she was the one who started that and got the first class through that. She also serves as an adjunct professor at Jefferson State University. There's so many other things that I could tell you about her but you know her, most of you do, and those of you who do, do not you've had an introduction to her. So please, uh, let's welcome uh, back home uh, one of our own, Reverend Dr. Amanda Cunningham Duxworth. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Amen. It's good to be home. Amen. I've been missing y'all. Have y'all been coming to church? <laughs> Amen. We give honor to the spirit of the living God, to Pastor Wilder, the associate ministers, to all of you, my Heavenly Father's children. Amen. It's just good to be here. Amen. I don't know about you all, but I was created to worship Amen. God. Amen. Amen. I was created to worship God. Am I all right with this? Okay. I was created to worship and sounds like you all came to worship this morning. Amen. So I'm going to go ahead and pour my water. It might be a little holly nip in here. Amen. I don't know about you, but God has been good and I have a reason to worship. And since I was here last time, I believe somebody told me y'all paid off the mortgage. <laughs> Y'all got a reason to worship God. And as I look at our graduates today, we, any parents here got some children sitting on it, we have a reason. They're not in the street, they're not in jail, they're not in detention, they're in church. We have a reason to worship the Lord. Amen, it's so good to see everyone. I won't be before you long. I'm thankful for the opportunity, so we'll just get to the point. Amen. Anybody came to have church this morning? Amen. I'm always thankful for the opportunity to impart knowledge or to share in a manner that will help someone else be a better candidate, a better disciple, a better student for the Lord. So if you would, let's go to the New Testament, the Gospel according to Mark the eighth chapter.
the gospel according to Mark. When you get to Mark, let's go to verse 27. I'm reading from the New King James Version, so mine may read a little bit different from yours, but we should get there together. I think I need these heifers this morning. When you find your places, please say amen. amen. If you're still looking for us, say, Lord, help me. Okay. Sounds like we're there. In the Gospel according to Mark, the eighth chapter, beginning with verse 27. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the town of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. The word of God for the people of God. And if you'll pray with me, I'd just like to speak on the topic. What have you learned in this virtual class? What have you learned in this virtual class? Please pray with me. Spirit of the living God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing us, for blessing us despite our weaknesses. We thank you for our graduates. We thank you for family, teachers, pastors, peers, all of those who played a part of getting these students to where they are today. Lord, we realize we are all students and that we're still learning. Though all is not all that we want them to be, we thank you, Lord, that things are better than they used to be. So we come this morning seeking your Holy Spirit, your guidance, seeking answers, trusting you to heal our bodies, trusting you to deliver us from addictions, trusting you to pay our bills, depending on you to guide our children waiting on you to move in our secret storms. Help our children, Lord, those that are still struggling, that didn't make it today. Help our teachers, the professors, the parents that won't give up on their children. Holy Spirit, rain down. Let your power fall. Let your voice be heard. We are here to listen. We're here to learn. Lord, teach us to love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Again, the question that I pose to you this morning is, what have you learned on or in this virtual class? And I'd just like to expound upon three areas. I, I, I hope you've learned to listen. I, I hope you've learned to be a good student. And more than anything, graduates, I hope you learn to love. In this text, we have Jesus administering what I would call a virtual class. A class on the road to Caesarea Philippi. He had his disciples, his students, if I may, along with him that he was teaching along the road and and I, I could have chosen Mark's got Luke's gospel but I chose Mark's gospel because I like the way Mark deals with this text Mark helps us to appreciate the significance of being a good student we got any students in the room this morning Mark helps us to understand that that when we suffer there's a blessing in the end, and, and some theologians would suggest that that's what's called eschatological glory. What you're going through today, you know it won't be this way always. That there's a blessing in the end that helps you persevere and press past the pain of those late nights of studying and reading books and online exams. Persevere because you know there's payoff 
in the end. Amen. If you would allow me to use just a few of my homiletic privileges, I, I'd like to contextualize this text just to help us get a better understanding of what this virtual class is all about. You see, this was a life intensive course and the good news about it, some of us are still in class, amen? Now what I love about this teacher, this teacher, our parabolical teacher, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus, is if you look in chapter one of this Gospel of Mark, you'll see that the teacher took time to be taught. You, you, you'll see that the teacher took time to allow himself to be baptized and then introduced to the community. Well, what I like about this teacher is you also, if you go down a little bit farther in chapter one, you see he was taking some registration, y'all. He, he was sending out application to see who would like to be a disciple. Got any disciples in the room today? We're still taking applications. In chapter two, as we look at chapter two, he's dealing with conflict resolution. And, and graduates, I don't know just how you feel about that, but my grandmama used to say, live on. If you haven't encountered any conflict in life, if you haven't had any conflict with assignments due and instructors not liking you and wanting to fail you just because your skin is brown, live on. In chapter three, he calls his first 12 disciples. I'm talking about this virtual class now. In chapter four, he gets into a few parables. He, he talks about the kingdom. He talks about the lamp. He talks about the sword. And he uses these parables to help his disciples because he recognized that sometimes the disciples can't really understand heavenly terms as they relate to earthly situations. So he uses parables and share things that they could relate to. In chapter five, he goes on to talk about healing of demons and Jairus' daughter, who was just 12 years old, about the age of some of you. He talks about the woman that had the issue of blood for 12 years. And then in chapter six, he talks about rejection. Now, it's one thing to be rejected. It's another thing to be rejected by your own. He went home and his kinfolk said, that ain't nobody. That, that just Joseph, we remember when that boy was growing up. He can't tell us nothing. We, 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 we know that ain't nobody but Mary, not Mary, Mary. Mary and Joseph, boy, that grew up, we saw him running around. And as you're growing in life, some people will never let you grow up. But he knew who he was in, G, in, in the Lord. In chapter six, not only did he deal with rejection, but while he was trying to build the disciples, he encountered a death in his family. His cousin John got killed for preaching the gospel. And in chapter seven, he deals with sin and he command, talks about the commands of God against the conflict of what the traditional people wanted to do. And then he goes to chapter eight, which is where we will look at our sermon today. And in chapter eight, here he, this is the second time he do a, a large feeding. He feeds 4,000. And, and how many of y'all know there was no Golden Corral, there was no Piccadilly, there was no Ryan's. The brother blessed the bread and broke it and fed 5,000. Now why, why have I taken time to tell you all that's going on leading up to this story? These disciples, they were in a virtual class. They were learning on the road. But guess what? Some of them were not listening. Now one thing you should have learned in school in order to be successful, you got to listen. Because you see, there can be some excellent, outstanding information being shared, but if you're not listening, you can miss the blessing. So listening is very important in this learning process. You see, this was what they call an oral examination. I, I like the way Jesus put this together. This wasn't no take home test, it wasn't no online test, it was an oral examination. You see, he knew that they were ready for this exam because you see, they had had home economics 101, feeding 5,000 up there in verse one through 10. They had had humanities and world culture. He had dealt with the generations and new generations wanting a different way of wanting signs. Uh, he had dealt with philosophy 
because the Pharisees had been challenging him. So he had been in some debates. Uh, he knew that they had had health administration. He had healed uh, several people, Jairus' daughter and the woman that had to, so, so he knew that they had been exposed to the proper academic curriculum. But what he didn't know was who was listening? Who was listening? And I just believe in my sanctified imagination that every now and then Pastor Wilder comes and brings a hot, fiery sermon. He done prayed all night, the Holy Spirit had fallen upon him, and he come to church and somebody, <laughs> not listening. <laughs> but you know, the good thing about the Lord is sometimes those that we think are not listening, Amen. they're taking it in. Yeah. It's that one that you kind of look at like, you know what? There's just no hope. For, I'm just going to keep praying for that one. And then every now and then you have one that you wonder, what in the world have you been doing in church all your life? But the good thing about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit works in ways that we don't know. So some of those who are voted most unlikely to succeed, in the end, you find out you were listening. You got it. You learned the lesson. So in this text, the first question that Jesus asked in this oral examination, in verse 27, he says, Who do men say that I am? What are they saying about me out there? Do they know me? I've been walking around healing, blessing, and delivering. Restoring, what, who do men, uh, uh, these people have been watching from a distance, but you disciples, y'all been up close. Who do men say that I am? Or are you listening to what folks are saying about me or have you developed your own personal relationship? Who do men say that I am? And no doubt the disciples must have thought this was a multiple choice. <laughs> Because they said, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, other folks say one the prophet, but we really don't know. Who do men say that I am? Now, I, I believe I have maybe just a few of our theologians from ITC in here, and some may have expounded on Karl Barth. You know, Karl Barth would say Jesus was the mediator, the reconciler that connected man to God. And, and then there may have been some of those who studied Paul Tillich and they would suggest that he established this systematic theology so we could understand there's a relationship, there's a system of getting to know God. Amen. And then maybe there were a few who listened when we were talking about Martin Luther. Martin Luther said, look, these Catholic church folks, they're all a bunch of mess. All the stuff they got y'all doing, forget it. Let's establish the 95 Theses. And then maybe there were some who remember Augustine. Augustine says that, you know, that Jesus is somebody. Because even when I didn't want to be a disciple, even when I didn't want to do right, even when my mama told me to go to church and I told her I don't want to go up in there, even when I resisted and tried to do my own thing, there was this thing called irresistible grace. It was so strong, it caught me and pulled me when I knew it. There was this irresistible grace. I couldn't reject it. Before I knew it, I was caught up. I was covered. I was protected by a God that loved me despite my nasty self. And then maybe there was somebody who studied Slyamaka. Slyamaka suggests that, well, who is this Jesus? This Jesus is a person that we have absolute dependence on. Now, I like the way Slyamaka put that thing together because I realize I can't breathe without him. I can't move without him. I can't think without him. I am nothing without him. But be careful who you're listening to. Be careful who you're listening to. These theologians, they, they have some good ideas, and your friends have some good ideas, but sometimes your friends will tell you some stuff that will get you into some trouble. Amen. If you don't mind, I'd like to suggest you establish your own board of directors. Amen. 
What you mean, Sister Preacher? Identify some folks that got your best interests at heart. Amen. Some people who are going to tell you not only what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. Amen. When the dress too short, when too many things are hanging out, when, when your pants are sagging, somebody who's going to tell you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. Establish a board of directors, somebody who can be a mentor to you. Somebody that will go with you, that will lead you, that will show you, that will teach you. Somebody you will listen to. Identify somebody in the community. It could be Mr. Bob down at the store, didn't even finish high school. But Mr. Bob or Miss Mary may have some good, what they call mother's wisdom. That can tell you how to get through the going through. When you can't make sense of life and you can't trace God and it seems like things are crazy and you just need somebody to pray your crazy self out of your crazy action. Yes. Establish somebody in the community, a person of wisdom, a person of strength, a, a person who got the spirit of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Somebody can pray you through when you don't know how you're going to get through yourself. But be careful who you listen to. Now, when you listen, make sure you learn the lesson. You see, sometimes people will label you. Label, label, label you. Label you. They, they, they'll put a mark on you and say, no, no that one's not going to make it. That one's piped for prison. Uh, that one's going to have 15 babies by the time she's 50. Well, that won't work. She's going to have 15 babies by the time she's 45. People will label you based on where you live, where you come from, the color of your skin, your age, your economic. People will label you. Don't let folks label you. If we look in our text in verse 29, Peter was labeled. Peter was, you see, Peter had a little problem. Peter cussed. Peter was outspoken. Peter had a temper. They look, you know, he not listening. Anybody talking that much is not listening. But what I like about Peter, Peter was not afraid to step out and try things with Jesus. Now, some of us try things with the wrong folk, but don't be afraid to try things with my Jesus. Peter was always talking. He was not voted the most likely to succeed. But when posed with the question, who do men say that I am? Jesus takes it a step further and asks him a personal question. When, when it gets personal, how many of you really know Jesus? How, how many of you going on what the deacon said, what the Sunday school, how many really know Jesus? I promise you there will become times in your life when you will need to know him for yourself. I, I promise you that it, it, it's good to hang on to grandma prayers. It's good to praise God on mama's prayers, but you better pray a few for yourself. So when the question is posed to Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ the son of the living God. And, and Jesus knew that flesh and blood had not revealed that to Peter. But what I find interesting in the text that makes it a little complex, Jesus warns them to tell no one. They in class, Peter gets the right answer. And Jesus said, don't tell anybody. In my few years of teaching, I've had a few students that love to study. I've had a few students who complete their assignments on time. They are my, they're on the dean's list, they're on the president's list, they're on the honor rolls. But every now and then I get a student that wants the answers to the test without taking the test. Now I'm sure none of y'all never experienced anything like that where you can get the answers to the test before taking the test. You know, if your friend got they just emailed it to you. But here in this text, Jesus said, don't give out the answers to this test. Said, Why would Jesus want them to hold the answer? And, and what I came to find out is Jesus knew that there's some lessons in life 
that you only learn by living. There are just a few lessons in life that you got to go through yourself. There are just a few lessons in life you can't just pick up the paper and copy off somebody else's paper. There's just a few lessons in life you got to live and let the Lord lead you. So Jesus said, don't give out. I know you want to help your friend, but don't give out the answers to this test. They got to come to know the Lord for themselves. And although Peter was labeled, Peter was listening. Peter was listening because Peter recognized that there was something greater going on with him and with Jesus. When, when he saw Jesus walking on the water and Jesus said, come to me, Peter stepped out. So while Peter may have failed philosophy, he knew something was going on. I, I stepped on the water and I didn't go down. There was somebody holding me up when I should have failed, when I should have sunk into sin. There was somebody that caught me. Anybody in here been caught by Jesus? But maybe I'm the only one that he's lifted when I've been stuck in my own mess. But Peter, Peter was listening even though he was labeled. Now, 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 I, now I, I know most of y'all good church folks and, and everything, but, but it does a critical lesson in love. You see, you got to listen, you got to learn, but you got to love. Now, I, I know some of y'all been around here soldier boying and twerking and nay nay and wobbling and carrying on. Y'all don't know nothing about that, huh? I, I know some of y'all been crazy in love with Beyonce. I know some of y'all been looking and listening to Tink talking about treating me like somebody. That kind of love won't get you where you need to be. I, I, I see some of my folks, they, they don't know these young folks, but they, they heard about Luther. Oh, oh yeah, they, they heard Teddy saying it's so good. What Teddy say? Loving somebody. I see they acting like they're in church, room, but I see that. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, oh. I know some of y'all been at Charlie Wilson concert. Hanging out with Keith Sweat and Usher and all of them. I, I know some of y'all been out there before she died, Whitney. Saving all my love. But that kind of love is not the love that you need to get through this virtual class. This virtual class is a kind of love that's unconditional. Uh, some would call it agape love. A God that can see you in your mess and love you enough to make you want to do right. Anybody been there? A God that can see you in your mess, not your church clothes, but you know the other kind of clothes you wear. A God can see you where you're not supposed to be when you're not supposed, and love you so hard that you start thinking, I got to do better than this. Anybody that can see all my junk and all my mess and love me despite myself, I, I think maybe Gladys Knight had a, a glimpse of that love. She said, if anyone should ever write my life story for whatever reason there might be, just tell them Jesus is the best thing that ever happened. Anybody know about that love <laughs> to me? Uh, maybe some of y'all listen to Kurt Franklin. He said, oh, it's something about the name Jesus. Anybody else, can you say Jesus? He said it's something about the name Jesus. It is the sweet, sweetest name I know. Oh, and then Sister Shirley, I think Sister Shirley sure enough got that thing. Sister Shirley said, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, oh how I love. Anybody ever have to call him? Oh, how I love calling. Your name, sometime in the morning, sometimes late at night, but when I call, woo, on his name. Oh, he's the only one that can make everything all right. We're talking about the love of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, there's a new song. They say, something happened when I called. Anybody calling? On your name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 
This is the Jesus we are talking about in this virtual class. Now, now I could tell you about all those folks and how they were labeled and how they were written off, but I tell you, I want to take you to a new gospel. It's gospel according to Amanda. Amanda chapter one, verse one. You see, I know what it's like to be labeled. I know what it's like to be written off, but I know what it's like to serve a Lord who's able to lift you when other folks want to write you off. I know what it's like to listen to those old seniors sing those songs. When other folks vote you out, he votes you in. I, 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 I learned that he really is a bridge over troubled water. You see, I was coming out of Huntsville in that ice storm and the car was sliding and all I could say was Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And somehow the car straightened up and I made it home safe. So I've learned. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I learned that he's bread when you're hungry. Oh see, right now you eat mama bread, so that's good bread. But when you get in college, sometimes the bread ran out. Sometimes the jobs ran out and, and you have to find out this Jesus for yourself. You, you can't copy off somebody's paper. You got to go on your knees yourself and get to know him for yourself. I, I found out that the Lord will fight your battle. Oh yeah, when enemies are all around you. Oh, you can hold your peace. Let the Lord fight your battle. You see, things ain't always been easy over there in Huntsville. But pastor, now when I sit in my corner office with my windows all around me, I know it wasn't because of my goodness. You see, the dean before wanted me out of there. But what she didn't realize was while she was trying to write me up, I was sending it up, saying, Lord, build a fence, woo, all around me. And sometimes, people, you got to pray for yourself. You got to pray. You don't have time to send an email and call mom and all. This is a virtual class. You're learning while you go. And you got to learn that you can trust in the Lord. We sing these songs and we sing these hymns, but I tell you, you can trust in the Lord. I, I think Brother Al Green, he got it. He said, what a friend we have in Jesus. Is he your friend, y'all? All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege. I don't have to carry all the burdens myself. What a privilege it is to carry all that stuff that's weighing you down. What a privilege it is to carry everything and just give it to the Lord in prayer oh he'll lift your spirit oh he will guide you oh he will help you when folks label you the Lord will lift you I was in the first grade at New Hope High School well elementary at that time and I never will forget this experience and I know it was nobody but the Lord first grade and my teacher sent a note home to my parents and said she can't learn. Yeah. We're going to put her in special education. They put me there, but they couldn't keep me. <laughs> oh, yeah. What they failed to realize, you have a middle class teacher dealing with a little African-American girl who might have been three, four levels below poverty. I don't know if they were even poverty. We were poured in food stamps. <sighs> but they couldn't relate. And what they failed to realize was this little girl, the head start that I started in, the teachers went to my church. They knew my parents. They looked like me. You take that little girl out of that head start and put her in a predominantly white school, with white teachers who did not want us to be there. I was scared, so I didn't talk. And rather than help me, they labeled me. They labeled me. They said she can't learn. They put me in special education. Now, some of you that may not be sitting on this seat, you've been labeled. And folks have said, you can't learn. You won't do well. You won't be nothing. You'll be pregnant. 
you'll be a high school dropout, you'll be in jail, you'll be all these bad things. People have labeled you. But don't take anybody's label but the Lord. You are a child of the King. If he's Christ, then you're Christian. Hold on to that. Let that sink into your mind, regardless of what people are saying to you or who your mama, daddy, daddy may be, don't know. Know that you are a child of the king. In that situation, I, when I got into special education, there was a teacher I'll never forget, Miss Virginia Shelton. She looked like me. She cared about me. She nurtured me. She taught me. And I started going through those exercises. I was having fun. You better have fun in class. I was having a good time. And she said, Amanda, you're not supposed to be here. I said, no, but I want to stay. <laughs> what I didn't realize was I had a teacher looking out for me. Because as a little girl, I didn't know I was being set up to fail. I wanted to stay in a place that wasn't good for me. I know some of your parents are telling you things that you don't want to hear. Grandma too old. Grandpa can't hardly walk. Mama don't. Sometimes God sends people to tell you things to help you that you can't see right now. I wanted to stay in special education. But she didn't stop until she got me out there. So when I go back to New Hope High School, I go back as Reverend Doctor. the one that was labeled, the one that wasn't supposed to make it. And many of you have had some negative things programmed in your mind. And I want you to ask God to help you find your purpose, find your place, find out what it is he wants you to do. Whether you be the next dean, the next congressman, the next president, whatever you want to be. That's the benefit of passing Jesus' test. You see, if you pass the test, you get the blessing. <laughs> All of a sudden, nothing becomes out of limits for you. You can go down on your knees and ask him. And I'm a witness. He'll provide. What have you learned in this virtual class? I hope you've learned to listen. I hope you've learned to be a good disciple, a good student. More than anything, love. Love even those who label you and expect you to fail. God's got a blessing for you. Amen. God bless you.